The Legend of Zelda is a series that has quite a legacy for itself. Many of the games have left their impact on the very industry itself, but with a series as expansive as this, there are going to be some games that get less attention. Uh, case in point, the handheld Zelda games are often put off to the side due to the fact that they're on weaker hardware, and that they tend to borrow a lot of their ideas from their console siblings. Though that doesn't mean that these handheld games lack an identity to call their own. I mean, just look at Link's Awakening, a Zelda game without a hero. When it comes to the Zelda series, the dungeons are the highlight of the game, and Link's Awakening is no exception to this. Every dungeon is a good example of a tightly designed space to navigate, with a special tool to find along the way to improve the flow of the game. Looking over all the dungeons in Link's Awakening, while I was able to find some genuine sparks of creativity, I don't think that any of the main dungeons shined brightly enough to make the game as a whole stand out. However, an optional dungeon that you can find in the game had something special about it it that made it sound out from the rest. It sure is boring around here. Entering this secret dungeon, there's a noticeable change in the art style from the rest of the game. That's right, before so many modern games were experimenting with art styles, Link's Awakening was willing to change things up for this one dungeon, which I'm surprised was carried over into the Switch remake. This appearance might look off when compared to the rest of the game, but looking at Link, his sword, the power bracelet, and his Hylian shield, you can tell that the important details were kept intact. The first floor is pretty basic, with the enemies of this floor being Tektites and Rededs, and the boss against Goma is pretty fitting for a mini-boss on this first floor, a solid challenge that can easily be overcome by a seasoned player. The second section is a unique twist on Zoro's domain, with the atmosphere being more fitting to a dungeon equivalent of this aquatic area. Many of the newer enemies here can glide across the surface of the water, which is an interesting challenge that adds a lot to the environment. It really sells the fact that Link is traveling to a variety of areas, despite this being just one really big dungeon. In fact, I can actually see where Dante's Dungeon Maker mode had originated from, and honestly it's a pretty good source to take from with the variety between all these floors. After pondering an orb-shaped mini-boss on this floor, I notice that the items that they leave behind give Link a new cosmetic look. Yeah, before Breath of the Wild, Zelda was actually dabbling into giving unique designs for Link that went beyond just a simple color swap, and I think it paid off. Sucks that this is only limited to this dungeon, but hey, it's still a cool idea. Continuing from the ocean area, we enter into the third section, which is heavily reminiscent of the Goron Mines, surprisingly enough. An environment that we wouldn't really see till later games like Twilight Princess, and dang, talk about laying the groundwork ahead of time. Though in place of the regular fire motif, we have Stalfos and Pose used as the primary enemies throughout this part of the dungeon, which is a pretty nice mix-up. Hell, even the boss is using this template as well, and uh, it's a pretty fun fight alongside the spooky scary skeleton theme. The last stretch has a rather twisted version of Hyrule Temple as the level theming, or a dark, dilapidated version of Ganon's castle. The dreary atmosphere, along with the more menacing enemies found in throughout this part of the dungeon, really sell how intimidating this part of, well, the series tends to get whenever you get to the final dungeon. And in general, the amount of diversity seen throughout this dungeon is quite commendable, especially since the rest of the game goes for a more appealing but far more simplistic toy-like aesthetic, which works for that part of the game, but this honestly stands out in just the right ways. The final area is a massive turn from left field in terms of tone and direction for this dungeon, but I see this new macabre looking floor as a loose interpretation of the graveyards used throughout the Zelda series. Many of the enemies here are either zombies or insects, which don't seem too unfitting in what is effectively a large graveyard. And these enemies, along with the sickly green color used in this stage, really sell the tone for this floor in a way that I'd never expect Nintendo to go for. However, I ran into some troubles with the boss of this floor. It's a three-stage boss that starts off basic, but soon devolves into face-tanking attacks. Almost as if, like, RNG or something placed it here in place of an easier boss that could be slashed to death. And while I don't want to end my analysis on a negative note, I noticed that there are no checkpoints in this dungeon at all, and it didn't save any of my progress that I made in it. So after I died, I was asked to start from the very beginning. Honestly, that's quite a bummer, as that one design choice could really mess with the experience of a very solid dungeon. Almost as much as a joke video can mess with the fans of Link's Awakening. Happy April Fools and all that, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.
Okay, but seriously, can I mention how Repentance just casually put in a new boss with the recent update? That is some good shit right there. Oh, and uh, Link's Awakening on Switch. Yeah, that's pretty fun. Definitely a solid 8 out of 10 experience, especially as a cozy little Zelda game with a very unique vibe going for it.